assessments. The missions team is currently collecting items to take on their next trip to Mexico. If you'd like to contribute, please pick up a flyer or check out our app or website to see the list of needed items. Thank you for your support. Iron Sharpens Iron, the men's ministry of Calvary Chapel, Fort Worth, meets on the second Sunday of the month, right after the second service in the barn. This is both an interactive and instructional time of fellowship where we get into the Word and build up our brothers in Christ. For more information, email info at loveneverfails.com. The Poema Community Awareness Outreach meets the third Saturday of every month from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. All first-time participants will need to complete the mandatory one-hour training course before participating in the outreach. Training will take place at 9 a.m. in the barn. The link to register for the training and outreach is available on the app and website. For more info, please email Paul Koo at paul at loveneverfails.com. Kids Church hosts Meet Me at the Cross every third Saturday of the month. Join our Kids Church servants for this special time of prayer and fellowship by emailing Danielle Maka at danielle at loveneverfails.com. Heart to Heart is hosting a summer fellowship for all couples. Join us for a potluck night full of summer fun, food, and togetherness. Visit the app or website for more info or email Mario and Rhonda at hearttoheart at loveneverfails.com. The women of Calvary Chapel from preteen all the way up to retired are welcome to attend Mary and Martha at His Feet Fellowship. This is a summer-long study and potluck fellowship where the ladies will encourage, admonish, and spur one another on to good works as women in the body of Christ. The first fellowship is on June 26th in the cafe after the second service. Contact Liz at info at loveneverfails.com for more details. Vacation Bible School will begin July 11th through the 15th from 6 to 8 p.m. Kids will unearth exciting evidence that proves biblical events are far more than mere stories. As junior archaeologists, our children will explore real-life archaeological finds that have shed light on the life of Jesus. Along the way, they'll discover the truth of Jeremiah 29:13 that God reveals himself to us when we seek and search for him with all our hearts. Kids ages 4 to 5th grade are welcome to attend. Servants needed. Contact Danielle Maka at danielle at loveneverfails.com. Thank you for your attention. Remember, you can get more information regarding any ministry and view all of our upcoming events by visiting our website or on the Calvary Chapel Fort Worth app. Have a wonderful day, and remember, love never fails. Good morning, church. It's so good to see you.
won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart, because you found me. Church, you may be seated now as we worship the Lord this morning with our tithes and offerings. That you were faithful then You'll be 
Thank the Lord one more time. So good to see you. The Lord bless you. Welcome to Calvary Chapel this morning. Good to have each and every one of you. Those that are tuning in live, it is always a blessing to have you as well. And just a few words before we get into the word this morning. Uh, I just had these, tr- uh, actually three things I need to mention to you. Uh, the first one was uh, on the tent ministry, the prayer t- uh, tent ministry, the update. Uh, did you know that in the first five months of this year that 42 people have come to Jesus Christ? Amen. And actually, that number is incorrect because yesterday another one came to Jesus Christ. So that's 43 this year. Amen. So praise the Lord for that. Also, uh, there's help needed. Uh, They asked me to announce this this morning. Church member is needing help with her child uh, who is autistic, Uh, needs an extra set of hands so she can help, uh, needs help around the house. Uh, during the day, just four hours a day, maybe two to five days a week. This is a paid position. You can call the church office and Berlinda will give you the information, uh, the contact information on how to uh, contact the individual. So with all that being said this morning, let's turn in our Bibles before we go to the Lord in prayer to 2 Timothy chapter 5. 2 Timothy chapter 5. And I want you to look this morning before we pray at verse 8. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And the church says, let us pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the word of God, your word, which is perfect truth. And Lord, your family, the family of God, your purchased possession, we all come to you this morning. Some of us, Lord, with deep hurts and deep wounds and others walking on the mountaintops, others in the valleys. But Lord God, you know each and every heart. And Father, I pray this morning on a message that many have never heard before. 
Lord, let there be a move of your spirit. Let there be a supernatural refreshing of your saints. Lord God, may we sense and feel your presence, the tangible presence, your, your presence, O oh God, your holiness, your righteousness, your joy, your love. And Lord, would you help me this morning somehow to not stain or soil these 16 verses, for they are holy, O oh God. And may every heart be so willing to hear, receive, and then act upon the Word of God. Lord, we pray now also for all of the, so many of our family uh, departing for vacations here at Calvary, Lord, uh, with the kiddos and so forth. Let, the, let them have a wonderful time and bring them all back home safely. With all that being said, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. Amen. We're in 1 Timothy again, chapter 5, beginning a new uh, section this morning. Now, this morning we're going to talk about, uh, uh, actually the topic or the title of the sermon is, What is worse than an unbeliever? Let's say that together. What is worse than an unbeliever? Now, don't, who said Democrat? Who is, <laughs> no. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm, I'm not political at all. You know, you know, I'm not. I'm not. No, it's just you have to have, you know, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. But here's what I want you to think about this morning. Timothy is a young man. He is reestablishing. He is rebuilding the church at Ephesus according to Paul's commands. How would you like to be a 33, 34, maybe 35 year old pastor, unmarried, and you are walking into a church like Ephesus that is full of all kinds of problems. Not, I mean, Paul has to, he says, Timothy, you have to go there and you have to command these false teachers the sum that they teach no other doctrine. Remember, they were t leading the people astray with fables and myths and fairy tales and genealogies and so forth. He says, Timothy, you've got to reinstate uh, prayer in the church. They're no longer praying. And not only that, I want you to elevate the women to their rightful place. They're not being taught the Word of God, and I want them being taught the Word of God. And not only that, the leadership stinks. Now, Paul didn't say stinks, okay? In case you wanted to email me on that. Okay. He said, listen, you have to reestablish godly leadership in this church. And not only that, they are giving heed to doctrines of demons and deceiving spirits. So would you say that Timothy had his hands full? Yes. Okay. Remember this too, that no other epistle gives us, the, uh, First Timothy gives us the most comprehensive instruction on church organization and leaders, church leadership in the entire Bible. A matter of fact, what is found in First Timothy is not even found in other epistles. Okay, so we have more information here. But this morning, as we look at this, remember that the theme of First Timothy is found in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And Paul writes unto Timothy and reminds him and tells him how he ought to conduct himself in the house of the living God, which is the pillar or the foundation of truth. Amen? Okay, now that we all have all of that under our belt, now we're going to move into another topic. We're going to, of course, we're going to cover uh, a, a few verses about our relationship with one another. And then we're going to cover a, a topic that is rarely preached from the pulpit on a Sunday morning. And that is the topic of what is a real widow and so forth. So with all that being said, just a statistic here. It says there are 13 million widows in America. 800,000 are widowed annually, and most are under the age of 55. This morning, we're going to be talking about what is worse than an unbeliever from our scriptures. And let me say this and preface it before we get into the word this morning. You know, unless you have belonged to, let's say, a Calvary, okay, all your life or whatnot, uh, and, or a di maybe a different type of uh, uh, denomination or something, you know, it, it's, it's, it's probably, if you haven't been in a church that teaches through the Bible, you then have probably never heard a sermon on 
uh, widows, okay? Especially, again, on a Sunday morning. And here's the deal that's, that I'm so amazed by. And that is this, that when Paul writes this letter, in, the, in all the, the verses that we have in verse Timothy, do you know that the, ver, the verses, this section before us right this minute, is the longest single section of this entire letter? There's 133 verses in Timothy, okay? And Paul is going to give 14 verses, or over 12% of them, to his concern about widows. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about it. Wouldn't you kind of like to have known a little bit more about doctrines of demons, deceiving spirits? Do you think you would maybe like to have known who the some were who were teaching the false doctrine? Are, are you all with me? Okay, but he doesn't do that. Now, those who say that Paul, you know, uh, was uh, anti-women, is, is, that's such a horrible rap that Paul got. Paul loves women. He, he is so concerned about the widows there in Ephesus that he contributes, again, 14 verses concerning them. So this morning, as we look here, we're going to go, before we get into the, the widows, we're going to look in chapter 5, the first couple of verses there, that deal with Timothy's, uh, the pastor, his relationship with the sheep, okay? So let's begin this morning in verse 1 of uh, 1 Timothy 5. Paul tells Timothy, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers. In other words, brothers being your equal, we're brothers one with another. Now, th this command here is not telling Timothy, Timothy, now if you have an older person that is out of line, don't you ever, ever, ever rebuke that person. But that's not what this is saying at all. The other thing is, too, when it uses the word older man here, it's not talking about like the elders, the office of the elder. It's talking about an older person, an older man. So what is Paul telling Timothy? He's telling him, he's giving him a word, this don't rebuke, only found here in the New Testament. And the word rebuke in the Greek literally means this. It means to strike at. In other words, uh, it, to, to strike at an older person by being very, very harsh or using loud, violent, cruel uh, words or language and so forth. So Paul tells Timothy, don't ever, ever do that to an older person. Don't ever speak to an older person like that. He says, but I want you to exhort them, meaning parakaleo to come alongside of that individual. Even though they could be mean, they could be doing something horrible in the church, he says, if he's an older man, you come alongside of him. That's tenderness with love. And look what it says. You treat the older man as if he were your own father. Well, that's good advice, isn't it? it that, matter, of fact, matter of fact, that's a command. Amen. You know, the Bible tells us this. He commands all believers. Listen to this. Leviticus 19.32. You shall rise before the gray-headed. And that's me. <laughs> and it says, and honor the presence of an old man. And fear your God, for I am the Lord. You know, most of our kids today, you know, in, in, the, in the church, I think they probably treat the older people with, with some respect. Amen? But there are those that are young people that treat older people really bad. You know, because, you know, what happens is, is that, you know, like sometimes when I go out and I have to go do, so, I have to, you know, I can't, I don't know if y'all know this, I, I can barely hear out of this ear, okay? It was in the war. <laughs> so I, I have to lean to hear you. And so I notice like the waiters, young waiters, it's like they want to say, if, can you not hear me? Uh, no, I can't, you know, but you don't have to be rude about it, you know, but I would, no, I would never do that. But you know, what they don't understand is, is that when you're kind of slow getting up or slow, like, you know, if you go to like Cane's, you ever go to Cane's, Raising Cane's? Don't go there. <laughs> I went there one time and you know, okay, here they have a person standing out there, right? And with your, to take your credit card, Right. Okay, well, I've had my credit card, and they're holding it, and I'm trying to put it in, and I'm shaking. And, and so they just look at me, and I'm saying, 
why don't you do that for me, okay? I mean, that is just a tiny little slot, I, you know? No. Now, he says here, now concerning older women, it says, here's how you're to treat them. Older women, Timothy, as mothers, and younger women as sisters with, watch this, with all purity. What does that mean? Well, that means there's a possibility that, Timothy, you might happen to look upon your sister as not a sister. Does that make sense? And so forth. You know, so mothers, you know, I remember years ago, I, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but she was a member here for many, many years, at least once a month. That's when my office used to be up there in the holy, the holy booth up in the top. <laughs> And uh, at least once a month, she would call, I need to talk with Pastor Bill. And so she would come up and we would talk. And she was very, very old and very sweet, very kind. And she would lecture me on being a pastor, (laughs) on what I needed to do, what I needed not to do. And it was okay. And so I would sit there for an hour. And sometimes she would scold me. Sometimes she wouldn't scold me. And it was just like my mother. And I treated her just like a mother. Although I was glad when she finally left. But <laughs> you understand? Say, so, hey, thank you, brother. <laughs> so anyway, that's the way we're to treat one another. You know, even Paul the Apostle, you know, he, he was, when he wrote the great the Magna Carta of the New Testament, Romans. In the 16th chapter, the 13th verse of Romans, he, he says to, to, to Rufus, uh, uh, chosen in the Lord, greet him and his mother who is mine. So Paul was talking about, you know what, your mom is just like my mom and I, I love her so. So this though was just not for Timothy, these relationships that we just talked about. You know, uh, this for the entire family of God. Listen, did you see the words again? Father, mother, brother, sister. Are those family words? Yes. Are we the family of God? Yes. Amen. And that's how we're to treat each other. Listen, we are the people of God. His own people, his own purchased possession. We're all accepted in the Lord. We're all filled with the Holy Spirit, sealed with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Our names are all written in the book of life, God's book of life. We are his family. And not only that, listen to me, we're the church of the living God. But more and more than that, we are the body of Christ. And guess what? The head of the church, he governs the universe through us, the body of Christ. Now, that is an unbelievable position. Amen? And we should be loving one another, caring one another in this body, treating one another the way God would have us to, be t- to do. The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 12, 25, it says this, there should be no schism or tearing apart or uh, division in the body, that the members should have the same care for one another. For if one member suffers... All the members suffer. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with that individual. Amen? We are the body of Christ. We're members one of another. We're members of the Lord. And here it comes now, our sermon for this morning. It says, honor widows who are what? Who are really widows. Do you, I, I want, you know, sometimes I want to say, now, Paul, listen. What, you honor widows that are really widows. Is there not a, is, or is there a difference? A widow is a widow. Amen? A widow is a person, you know, who lost the person that she loves, that she spent her life with, who wanted to continue to spend her life with. And it says, Paul says, you need to honor those who are really widows. And I'll get into that in a moment. So when we look at that word honor, it means to give aid to. It means to care for. Paul is talking to Timothy. He's talking to you. He's talking to me. He's talking to the church. He says, you are to honor, you're to care for real widows. What is a real widow? It is one who is left alone without any human support, no husband, no children, no family, absolutely nothing. Paul says, now that is a real widow. Now, you know, the thing that we need to see here is this. You know, in the first century, man, women had no rights at all. 
Can you imagine your husband dying and no one taking care of you and so forth? Most women then who were widowed, they ended up living on the streets, living in poverty, and they, and they were begging. Do you understand? But even today, in most of the world, not thank God in America, I don't know how many, but I know this, in the majority of the world, widows, man, they are living in horrible poverty. And there's no one to take care of them. And so Paul, you know, he's lifting the, the women to their rightful place and so forth. So you've got to take care of them. You know, listen, the Bible has so much to say about, say, widows, orphans, and, and so forth. Let me just give you a few scriptures of what God the Father, his, his love that he has for them. It says in Psalm 68, 5, it says that God is a defender of the widows. Deuteronomy 27, 19, God says this in his word, cursed is the man or the one who perverts the justice due the widow. In Exodus 22, 22, you shall not afflict any widow. If you afflict them in any way, God says, and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. Psalm 146, 9, it says the Lord watches over the widows. He relieves the widow in their distress. In James 1, 27, it says pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. The word visit doesn't mean they just, I'm going to come over and have coffee. It means it's not a social visit. The word visit means that you go to give aid to, Amen. Aren't you glad we take care of orphans in Mexico? I thank God for that. Listen, so what, if you're here this morning, and we have many widows in Calvary Chapel, I want you to remember this. I know you know it, but just a refresher. God loves you. God is your defender. God is also your avenger. Amen. He will always take care of you when others will not. That's what God does, and that's what he is. Listen, God cares for all widows, but here, this topic this morning, he cares for all that are really widows. Look at verse 3. It says, give aid to, honor widows who are really widows. So, meaning those that are really alone again and destitute and devoid of any support. So, the early church cared for real widows, but they were not obligated to all widows. That's very important. Now look at verse 4. But if any widow, if they have children, grandchildren, let them, meaning the grown children, the grown grandchildren, first learn to show piety at home. Christianity always begins in the home. Amen? And so show piety at home. And look what they're to do. The, the, the grown children. It says they are to repay, say that word, repay their parents, plural. Man, I underline that one. That means mom and dad. Amen. Hey, when, when, uh, never mind. No. So the church is not respond. Oh, I didn't finish. I'm sorry. Repay. I got so excited. I, I'm going to miss the best part. Repay their parents. Why? For this is good, acceptable, or literally it's well-pleasing before God. So welfare, if you will, aid the way God intended it to be. Exodus 20, verse 12, where the, the commandment, honor thy mother and thy father. So the church is not responsible for widows that have a family grandchildren and, and so forth and children it says children you're to repay your parents isn't god good man i you know i'm gonna get thomas i'm telling you you know <laughs> oh so and let me say something it, you know really taking care of aging parents is hard that's not an easy task I mean, boy, you think about all of that, and you know, especially if they're if they're sick and they're ill, and I mean, and then just you know, every when I go to the hospitals and so forth, it always just breaks my heart. Or I have to visit the doctor's office, and and I see the caregivers, their their son or their daughter, and uh, you know, I, I saw a guy the other day older than me, and his dad was still alive, and he was helping him get into the doctor's office. It took five minutes to get from the door to the seat it was only 10 feet away because he could barely move, and he had the walker and so forth, and I just started praying over them. You know what I mean? I mean, just praying for them. Oh, God, strengthen that man. Help his son. 
and so forth, and how they go up to the, to the, to the nurse's station there and give him all the information, and, and the, the poor guy could barely hear, and so his son was yelling into his ear a little bit, trying to help him, then, then he had to help him all the way back. Boy, you know, that, that's heartbreaking, but thank God that he had a son that would do that, amen? Yeah. And I said, oh, Lord, you're so good. You know, and, and so, I mean, it can be difficult, as you know, to take care of the aging. You know, my grandmother, as I told the first service, so special in my life. I mean, I loved her. And, uh, you know, I knew more about my grandmother than I knew about my own mother and father. You know, and we were so close and we lived on the farm and, and, and that's out there in Keller that she had. And, and uh, I, like I told the first service, I never forget when she became a widow. Uh, I was six years old and, and I was in the living room of the farmhouse. And my grandfather, his name was Woody Thomas Pierce. And he, he was uh, sitting in this big red chair that he always, that was where he sat. and had his little uh, place to put coffee, you know. And back then they drank coffee, you know, they poured it in the saucer and drink it. Does anybody remember that? <laughs> Thank you in the back row. Because they, they did. And, you know, you know. <sighs> I'm going to talk to y'all. And so, anyway, my grandfather had just had a terrible operation. And he wasn't fond of doctors. And he was a tough, tough old man. And he sat down. I'll never forget it. And my grandmother called him Dad. And, 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 she's, and she goes, Dad, we've got to go back to the hospital. And he says, Jesse, I'm not going. He said, I'm going to die right here in this chair. And he did. He died right there in that chair. And my grandmother whew, became a widow right then. Well, I was only six years old. And I'm not going to tell you any more of this story. I can't believe I got so emotional. You know what was cool about my grandmother? She was, well, she loved the Lord, but I had a dog, and I think I probably shared this years ago with you. I had a dog named Rennie. Hello, Ren Tin Tin. <laughs> but, but this was a collie, a beautiful collie, and that dog would sleep with me on the farm, and if, I, if he didn't get to come in the house, he'd sleep outside my window, and we were, I mean, we all over the, just wherever I went, he went. So I was with one of the, the hands out on the tractors in the back 40. There's a thousand acres there that they farmed. And I was in the, on there, his name was Mr. Pipkin. And I was on the, with him. And you know those, remember the disc that rolled? Well, Rennie, my dog, is running along the side over there. And she wants, he wants to get in my lap. And I'm going, Rennie, stay back, stay back. And he went under the plow. And it cut my dog in half. And I, so, I know. Now, but Wait. Now, I'm six years old. I grab my dog. I mean, I'm going, oh, I mean, I'm weeping like a, like, like a little boy. I was a little boy. I ran all the way back with my dog from the back 40 to the farmhouse, screaming for my grandmother. She came out on the porch just as calm as could be, looked at me and said, lay, lay your dog down, Billy, right there. I laid him down. She went in the house, got a, 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 some water. And it was soapy water, and she had some cat gut and a string and a needle. And she washed his insides out, sewed up his intestines, sewed him up, and he lived. Oh. Yeah. That's a true story. And then I took care of her the best that a six-year-old could. Now, it says here that we just learned that the widow's grown children, they have a responsibility that to their parents. In other words, your parents raised you. You know, they put, it, today we could say they put braces on your teeth, you know, and they, and they did this and did that. They bought your clothes. They put you through college. And all, you know what I'm saying. They, they raised you. So God says, now you take care of them when they get old. They didn't say that's going to be easy. Amen. But he said, that's what I'm requiring you to do. See, the honor thy mother and thy father is still a commandment. Amen. And not only that, did they have pensions back then? Did they have retirement back then? Did they have Social Security back then? No, they had absolutely nothing. So, you know, there's a Dutch proverb that says this about kids raising their families or taking care of their family. It says, it frequently seems easier for one poor father to bring up ten children 
than for 10 rich children to provide for one poor father. Or we could say, or one poor mother. Amen? Now, Jesus, you know what Jesus did on the cross as he was bearing the sins of the world? Do you know he talked to, he talked to two people? He leaned over and he talked to the thief on the cross. Amen? Today you'll be with paradise me forever. And then he talked to someone else. He looked down and he says, Mother, Mary, Mother, behold thy son. And it was John. John, behold thy mother. And from that hour, it says that John took Mary into his own home. Can you imagine our Savior on the cross bearing the sin of the world and yet he, his mind and heart was on his own mother. She, is, she was a widow. Joseph was not alive. But I wonder why Jesus didn't say to his half-brothers and half-sisters, why don't you take care of them? Isn't that interesting? I, and there's no answer. We have no answer. You know, but I would love to know why. Now, so Jesus cared for, for widows. And so when we look at all that, now look in this fifth verse, Paul gives us a description of a real widow. Now she who is really a widow and left alone, trust in God, continues in supplications and prayers night and day. So a real widow, Paul says is this, is a one her husband has gone. And she has absolutely no one. She has no children. She has no grandchildren. She has absolutely no family. She has no provision at all. She is all alone in this life. Paul says, now that's a real widow. And not only that, she, he says a real widow does something. Uh, the ones that are born again, they trust in the living God. The Bible says, God cries out in Jeremiah 49, 11. He says, oh, let your widows trust God. In me. Paul says also that a real widow continues night and day in prayer. In other words, a widow, listen, when they lose those they love, they know that prayer is the work. Amen? Boy, they do. And they're praying night and day to the Lord. And, and they know, they're like, she's like the, the, a widow becomes like the persistent widow, the one who prayed persistently in Luke 18, 1. Remember? Jesus said that man Pardon me, men ought always to pray, <clears throat> pardon me, and not faint. Or like Anna in Luke's gospel, chapter 2, I think 36, 37, right in that area, who had been uh, uh, 84 years from her virginity that she had been a widow. Think about that. And there she was in the temple night and day. She, her home now was God's home. And she was there praying night and day and, and so forth uh, to the Lord. She was old, very old, but she was still very active, amen, in the things of God. And so Paul says also, but in verse 6, he says, but listen, if, if Timothy, he says, but she who lives in pleasure, that means living the fast life, indulging and so forth, is dead while she lives. So Paul is saying, this, this person, this widow is not qualified. Now, in other words, we could bring it up to date and say, you know, she lives in an assisted living area, nothing, uh, facility, nothing wrong with that. And, and then, the, you know, they, there's a free junket or a free bus uh, that comes and pick them up, you know, Mondays and Fridays. And it's a free junket all the way up to Oklahoma, you know. And uh, you know what I'm saying? You know, you know, you know there's, a, there's two casinos out there. I don't know. One of them's called Choctaw. And the other one's called something. I don't know what it is. Anybody? Ah. So, and yeah, Windstar, thank you. So, in other words, it's like, well, she used to come to church every Sunday with her husband, but now that she's, he's gone, she doesn't come back. So, her husband is dead, and she's dead spiritually. She's a stranger to true life for some reason here. She's a lover of pleasure more than lover of God. So, Paul says, Timothy, these things command, verses 3 through 6, you command them, Timothy. Why? That they may be blameless. They, the children, the grandchildren, and the church at Ephesus, that they may be blameless. So he's saying this, 
if you subsidize or give aid to a widow like that who is living that type of lifestyle, you bring a reproach upon the body of Christ. And he says, so don't do that. Now watch this, verse 8. But if anyone does not provide for his own, his near family, his own flesh and blood, and especially if he doesn't provide for those of his household, his immediate family, he has what? Denied the faith. Look at this word. And is worse than an unbeliever. What is worse than an unbeliever? Paul just told us. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I tell you what, I know that studying out my, my Greek books and so forth from Greek scholars, this phrase is so strong in the Greek. Let me read, give it to you from the uh, Phillips translation. He says, he's denied the faith that he professes and is worse than a man that has made no profession of faith in Christ. Now listen, he's not beating up unbelievers here. What he's saying is to them is that, listen, if unbelievers take care of their family, how much more should a believer take care of their family? Amen? And he's saying, if you don't, you are worse than an unbeliever. And you've denied, completely denied the faith, meaning you know what God's Word says, and yet you turn your nose away from it, you neglect it, you say, I'm not going to do it. Listen, man... What is worse than an unbeliever? He says, those that don't provide for his own household. Aristotle put it this way. He says, a man must starve. A man must himself starve before he would see his parents starve. Philo, on preaching on the, the, the commandment to honor thy mother and father, said this. He says, when old storks become unable to fly... They remain in their nest and are fed by their children who go to endless exhortation, exertions to provide their food because of their piety. You know, listen, being a caregiver for your mom or your dad or grandparents, well, that's a hard thing, isn't it? I mean, it, I mean, especially if, they're, if it's Alzheimer's or they, they get lost in all of those things. It, it's heartbreaking. You know, I, I, I did a, a funeral service of a dear saint that went to this church for many, many years. And, and that woman wrote me every week a letter, uh, every week. And I kept every letter that she has ever written. And she was in a, a place because she was losing her memory, didn't know who she was or where she was. And I would visit her until she didn't know me. And when I did her funeral, <clears throat> her children were telling me that they would take her outside and because and, and, and she said, where am I? And, and, and what street is this? And she, they would take her out and say, this is the name of the street. And, and, and say, okay, I know where I'm at then. And then, then 10 minutes later, she didn't know. And she could just wander off outside the door. Loved one, that's hard. Do you understand? It, it's challenging. I mean, boy, and none of us want to have to go through heartache like that and so forth. But can I tell you, it's whenever we, we start becoming a caretaker, it, it, it means that not only is it hard on the caretaker, it's hard on those being taken care of. No parent... No mother, no father, no grandmother, no grandfather, they don't want to lose their dignity. Amen. Not only do that, they, 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 they don't want to lose their independence. Boy, that's the worst thing. My sister's 91 years old. She, and the only prayer I pray for her is the one she tells me, I never want to leave my home. This is where I want to die. I never want anyone to have to take care of me. I never want to lose my independence. She's still independent right now. Just even though she's gone through the cancer and so forth. Yesterday she went motor yard. I said, Joanne, you've you you got all this money in the bank. You can't take it with you. Hire somebody to mow that yard. I don't you tell me what to do, Billy. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You know, but, but the truth is, is, is that, you know, sometimes it is. No one wants to lose their independence. Amen. 
Now, look at the qualifications for widows who are supported by the church here. There's qualifications. Verse 9, do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the what? Number. Now, in the Greek, that means to write down upon a list. So it seems here, if we understand this correctly, that the early church, they had an official list of qualified widows, okay? So real widows, number one, they had to be at least 60 years of age to be put on the list. The younger widows, those, you know, Paul was, well, they're able to work, they could support themselves and so forth. But probably these real widows, the ones that were over 60, they, they it seems like this official um, ministry, if you will. It, they served in the church there at Ephesus, meaning that they probably, uh, well, they were no doubt prayer warriors, but they, they probably took care of those that were ill. They went to the home. They probably took care of orphans. Does that make sense? And visited people and so forth. So that, that's a capacity they served in the church. And not only that, look at the other qualifications. It says, and not unless she has been the wife of one man. Now, the, the word wife of one man in the Greek is literally uh, a one-man woman. Now, that, remember when we talked about elders and deacons? The exact same thing, the exact same requirement. So it's not referring to marital status here. It's referring to their conduct. In other words, she didn't chase other men. She was devoted to one man. Amen? And not only that, she loved that man. Now, so in verse 10, Paul now gives us, the, tells Timothy, here are the qualifications and also the questions that Timothy, that you should ask. And so the first one, you could say it this way, is she well reported of for good works? In other words, does she have a reputation for good works? Is it common knowledge there around Ephesus that she loves people, reaches out to people, and is, and, and is wanting to help people? The second thing, if she has brought up children, that word brought up there is only used here in the New Testament, this right here in this place, and it means literally has nourished children. Now, that could mean that she nourished orphans. Does that make sense? Not just her own children. And so she could be a, a widow, could never have children, right, if she's barren. Are you all with me? Okay. And so, it, uh, nevertheless, so that wasn't going to remove her, exclude her. If she's lodged strangers, so she has to have a, does she have a heart of hospitality? You know, like I told the early service, you know, they didn't have Marriott courtyards back then. You know, they didn't have Presbyterian night shelters or the Union Gospel Mission and so forth. So hospitality, when Christians came into town, did, did you open your door and say, come on in and so forth. And then it says the next thing, it, and did she wash or if she has washed the saints, the set apart ones as Christians feet. Now, that was just a common courtesy. In the culture back then, everybody wore sandals, you know. It would be like you walking in here with flip-flops on and, you know, you've been out walking all day and you're sweaty and stinky and, you know, and, and you walk in here and there's a basin of water and we wash your feet and say, come on in, you smell halfway decent now. Does that make sense? And so that, that's what this was saying right here. So she had a, you have to have a humble servant's heart. You know, Jesus, whenever he entered the house of Simon, you know, he said, he turned to the woman, but he was speaking to Simon. And he said, you know what, Simon said, you know, I entered your house. You didn't give me a basin of water. You didn't wash my feet. But this woman, she's not ceased to be, she's weeping and she has washed my feet with her tears. So it was a common thing to do those things and, 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 and uh, hospitality and so forth. And then she has the sec next one, if relieved the afflicted. In other words, the hurting and so forth. And if she's diligently followed every good work. So this widow, the real widow, would have a kind heart. She, 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 she would help the hurting and, and she was also committed. It says, look at it, diligently following every good work. So Paul says to Timothy, he says, Timothy, these are the godly qualities that look for in real widows. Now look at verse 11. He says, but refuse the younger widows. In other words, don't put them on the official uh, widows list, if you will. And the reason for when they have grown 
I'm sorry, when they have begun to grow wanton against Christ, they desire to what? Marry. So the word wanton, which is only here in the New Testament, it means when they start, they're lonely. Any, come on, a younger widow would be lonely, amen? And even an older widow, all right? And so whenever they have this, they're desiring intimacy. They're desiring to be loved. They want a home. He says, and they, he says, and then having condemnation because they've cast off their first faith, talking about these younger women. Now listen, to desire to marry again for a younger woman usually is a normal desire, amen? So what is Paul saying here? He's saying whenever they cast off their first love, he's talking about the widow's pledge. The word there, it literally would be an oath that they made saying, yes, I want to be taken in on the official list. And my oath is this. I never want to marry again. I'm going to remain a widow and I'll be working there at the church. Does that make sense? Amen. Okay. Then he says this. And besides, they learn to be idle, speaking about the younger uh, widows, meaning they have too much time on their hands and, and, and so forth because they don't have any financial worries, he says. And look at the result. They wander about from house to house and not only idle, but also gossips, busybodies. In other words, they meddle in other people's business. But this next one, saying things which they ought not. One translation is for saying things is dangerous tongues. Oh, saying things that they should not say. So Paul says the church is not going to support widows like this from the tithes of the people and so forth. And he's not saying that all widows are like this, but he is wise and the Holy Spirit is leading him. Therefore, I desire younger widows to what? To marry, to bear children, to manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproach, reproachfully. So Paul says, okay, you need a new husband, new children. I wouldn't want new children. Amen. New children. And now the old position you once had now becomes your new position again. You need to guide the house. And here's the reason Paul was saying this. He says, because you don't want to give an opportunity to the adversary, okay? The word opportunity there in the Greek literally means a beachhead, okay? A base point of operations. And so he's saying this, you don't want to give a, a place where the enemy can plant his foot. And when we think of the enemy or the adversary, we know number one was Satan, amen? But it was also Satan and the some, meaning the false teachers. And what did they do? They opposed the faith. They, they were teaching myths and so forth. And he says in verse 15, for some, meaning the younger widows, for some have turned, have already turned aside after Satan. Man. So the adversaries of Ephesus, we know who they were. They were the ones that were teaching the myths and the fable. They were the false teachers. And here's what they remember. I taught it a couple of months or a month ago. They were trying to remove the women from their rightful godly roles as a, as a wife or mother. And, and the reason I say that is because it says they turned aside. We get our word again, apostasy from that, which takes us back to chapter 4, verse 1. Let me read it to you. It says, now the Spirit expressly says in latter times, some will depart, apostatize, meaning willfully and deliberately turn their backs on the faith. And it says, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, and here's the first one they said, forbidding to marry. That's what the false teachers were doing. Now, Paul just said, Timothy, command them to, not command them, but tell them to remarry. Okay? But here the false teachers said, no, no, not marry. You're forbidden to have any marriage at all. So it seems that the false teachers, that the widows were their targets, if you will. And then he says, if any believing man, or we can say our believing woman, has widows, meaning in their home, in their house, in their household. Let them what? Let them give aid. Let them relieve them. Give aid. Now, this, now listen, again, this is the family's responsibility. And do not let the church 
be burdened, meaning with them, with the widows, that it may relieve or be free to give aid to those who are really widows, those that are really left alone, those that really have no one at all. You know, that is the way it, it ought to be, but that's not always the way it is. Amen? You know, the early church cared for widows. And, and you know what? We care for widows here. We care for widowers here. We care for all people here. Amen? And, you know, I had, uh, I had Cisco the other day. I said, I, I need to know why. Cisco, I said, do some research for me. I said, I want to know why Paul gave 14 verses to, to widows in the first century because we have, I don't have any historical biblical evidence actually of what was going on. So he starts doing some research and so forth. And he found out that in the Roman Empire, the reason they had so many widows, was beca- uh, young widows, was because it was the older, rich Romans marrying the very young women, and the older guys died, and so they had all these widows. Matter of fact, 30 per- um, 30% of the widows, uh, their uh, people, the women, were widows in the Roman Empire. Can you believe that? And not only that, most of them, the majority, ended up living in abject poverty. So Paul was addressing these things. You know, our early church father, Polycarp, he says this about widows. He calls on widows. He says, they are an altar of sacrifice on which Christians should lavish their offerings. In other words, we need to take care of widows. We need to take care of offerings. We need to take care of one another. Amen? Hermes put it this way. He says he urged believers at that time, he he says, to go out and buy oppressed souls, meaning the widows, instead of buying more fields to plant. That's good advice. You know, listen, you know, I grew up in a different time than many of you. You know, uh, you know, when TV was different, the programs were different. We didn't have the Internet and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, some of the old movies, you know, Leave it to Beaver and all that stuff, you know, portrayed the family life. And, and there was always that everyone's favorite. I don't know if it was in the 70s or whenever it was out, but it was called The Waltons. Y'all remember that? Yeah, and, you know, I mean, who would want to be part of that family? Grandpa, you know, Grandma. Living out there, you know, poor, starving to death. No, no. You know what I mean? It was, a, I don't know how many years it ran, but, but it ran a long time. And, I mean, you know, you remember how they ended the show, you know, John Boy and all them, and they would just show the house, and it was at nighttime, and the light started going out. Everyone, remember what they did? Good night, Elizabeth. Good night, John Boy. Remember? What was the other one? Mary Ellen, thank you. Good night, Mary Ellen. Good night. Good night, Grandpa. Good night. But that was a movie. That wasn't reality. Do you understand? And if you watch that, like I did when I was a young man, you know, you'd say, that's the kind of family I want to be a part of. They had their problems. They had this. But when they, when they were sick, the Grandpa would take care of Grandma. Remember how, you know, he was... You, I'll take care of her. I think her name was Esther or something, remember? And, and so, you know, everybody wants a family like that. But it wasn't, that's not reality. But I want you to listen to me now. We are the true reality. We are the church. No, no. We are the church. We are the family of God. We are to love one another, support one another. We are to take care of one another. We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. Amen? Oh, listen, I think about that. We take care of our own people. We're co-heirs with Christ. You know, years ago, you know, of course, I always close with a song, God is Good. You know, know, that's what we've done all these years, and, and both this pastor and my other one, too. But, but I also used to close out, remember that song? Uh, we are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And the day of our unity one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Remember that? You know, that's... The world will know us by our love. We are to take care of one another. 
And I can tell you this for 30 years in this church, we take care of our own. We take care of those that have truly hurt. Listen, I can tell you times I could go back and say, and I won't mention his name. Uh, he, was, he was a fearless servant, silent service, servant of the living God. Back when we had our playground behind the building, I would, I would go back there and I'd say, what are you doing? And he had his paint out and he was painting the, all the steel and he was always doing something. And he was a, a financer. He would go in and take buildings, that, uh, companies that went bankrupt, and they'd call him to come in to resurrect them. And he made good money, and that's what he did for a living. One day he came up to my office up there. He came up often. And he says, I've got a big job in Hawaii, man. Bill, I'm going to be gone. Probably going to stay and retire there. I said, okay. I said, man, I'm going to miss you, brother. You've been such a blessing to this church. And, uh, but I didn't feel comfortable about it. And so he left. And then all of a sudden, about three months later, I had a phone call that was left and said, this person's name is that he's at a nursing home out at Hughley. And I went in, I'll never forget. He was nearly dead. He had, see, he didn't want me to know that he had cancer. So I go into to the area. God, what a sissy, Bill. So straighten up. <laughs> so I, I, I go in there. I finally find him. And I go in, and he's, he can't talk to me anymore because he has no voice left. And he only was hours away from going home. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and, and his eyes got big. And I said, you told me a lie. I said, you didn't think I was going to find you, did you? I said, Calvary Chapel, we don't forsake our own. Amen. And you know what? He didn't have a dime. And we buried him. And we took care of him. Amen. You see, that's what a church does. I'm going to close with something that I very rarely ever share. I'm very private about certain things at the church. But now that at my age, you know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Whenever in November, and I, a lot of people I know were thinking Bill was crazy about the pandemic and all this kind of stuff, but I've been following the pandemic from the moment that it was broadcast, talking, it wasn't even a pandemic, let's put it that way. Back in October of 2019, I started following it. I started praying. I said, Lord, is there something coming? Whenever before the pandemic, before we ever even shut down, remember in March, March 13th, 15th, when, when, the first time I'd ever preached to an empty church in my life. I told the board in February, I said, I believe it's going to hit us hard. And I said, I don't think we're prepared. I think everybody thinks it's just nothing. And I said, here's, here's what I want to do. I said, our stewardship, and some of my board members, they have been with me from the home fellowship. Do you understand? That's how long. That's 31 years ago. And I said, we are stewards over the sheep at Calvary Chapel. We have a responsibility for them. I don't know what a pandemic is. I've never been in a pandemic. I, I don't know what we're facing. I don't know what we're going to face. But I know this, that the Bible says that a wise man discerns the time, and he hides himself from it. Amen? And I said, what if our people, what if, if this pandemic, if it hits and we can't work or we can't, they, they can't, I, you know, do you understand? I, do, no, who knows what a, a pandemic is? We've never been through it, have we? Did we? So do you know how to plan? No. And here's what I sold them. I said, I want you to take $250,000 out of the church savings right now. And I want you to put it over in benevolence. I don't want one member of this church to lose their home, not be able to pay their electric bill, not pay their water bill, not feed their family. Or what? Maybe hospital. I do not know. But not one member under our watch. Do you hear me? I said, not one member under our watch 
will go under as long as we have money. Amen? Amen. They agreed. I didn't tell you about it because you might abuse it. <laughs> Amen. And you know what God did? Didn't cost a, didn't spend a penny. He provided everything because God cares. Now, I was very reluctant to share things like that, but I said it for this because it's timely with what we're talking about. We love you. We care for our own. And you do the same. Father, we thank you. We praise you. There's no one like you. And we give you the glory. We give you the honor. We give you the praise. Oh, you are holy. You are righteous. You are just. You are good. You are God. And we praise you in this place. Oh, God, we praise you in Jesus' name for who you are and how much you care for us, the sheep of your pasture. Bless every widower. Every widow, and let them know that they are loved in this place. In the greatest name in the universe, we pray. In the name of Jesus, and the church says, Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Amen. God is good, isn't He? Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? I, I am. I'm glad you came. <laughs> The Lord is good. If you're visiting for the first time with us, listen, I'm going to depart to the Welcome Center. And uh, there's a free gift over there. I'd love to give it to you. I'd love to meet you. If you need prayer, Jesse's going to close us out with song, and there'll be people here to pray with you. Men, don't forget, today is the men's fellowship. If you care to attend, I'll be teaching uh, in the barn and uh, probably be there in 15 minutes. So with all, that's all I have. God is good. God is so Bless you, church. We love you so much. Be safe.